talking uh, for the next probably about four weeks about Jesus's uh, really approach and then and then walking through what really he was born to do. And his ministry is incredibly important. He, the life that he lived, obviously on earth, <laughs> completely changed the world. And that gave recognition to the death that he died. But his life was always moving towards that moment. And I wanted to take some time and really study what we can learn from the approach to our destinies. And I think that that's exactly what you see in the life of Jesus on his way to the cross. And so really where we're going to pick up the story, where we're going to start looking through these principles is uh, at that last supper and then really in the garden. And those are the two main places where I want us to kind of zoom in on and recognize some of the things Jesus does on the approach to his destiny, on the approach to his death, that we should take away from and go, man, when I am on the approach to something difficult, when I'm on the approach to my destiny, when I am on the approach to the end of my life, what should I behave like? What has God asked of me? And most importantly, what do I need to remember that God has already spoken? Does that make sense? Okay, let's pray and get into it. Father God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you that you're a good, good father. And I pray that as we read today, God, as we get into your word today, that we would see so clearly the areas where you want to be by our sides. Pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. Okay, so the first thing I want to point out to us uh, is the typical reaction that we have, uh, and then the one that Jesus had. And I couldn't think of a better example of this uh, than when you look at the life of King David. And I'm sure every single person in this room has heard this before when you go to 1 Samuel chapter 11. And you have King David, uh, all the kings are supposed to go out to war, and he doesn't go out to war. So I'm going to read that to us really quick. It says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. And they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Okay, and we're going to, we're going to contrast that to the life of Jesus here in just a moment. But I, I want to point out so often what our reaction is when we think we have arrived, when we feel like we're either in the promised land or we're approaching the promised land, is so often we say, I don't have to keep doing what kings do. I don't have to keep doing what I'm called to do, what God's put me in my position to do. And I'm not trying to bash on David. Obviously, we love David. David's probably the greatest king of Israel other than Jesus. I mean, Man after God's own heart. But I think it shows you very clearly that even a man after God's own heart, when he is not actively doing what he's supposed to do, will tend to fall into laziness, bad habits. He'll he'll crack the door to the enemy. He'll go on a walk at the balcony and all of a sudden catch a glimpse of something. And because nobody's around. Because he's in the promised land. He's arrived. Nothing could pull him out of his promised land. But because he's made it, nobody's around to keep him accountable. And I think that's something I want to zoom in on. And I, I, I'm trying to make sure we're able to remember messages. And so I decided I'm going to uh, adopt the Pastor Robert method of hopefully giving us at least three points a weekend. That way you have something you can refer back to. Uh, But the first thing I want us to pay attention to is we need to know who's in charge. Because obviously David thought he was in charge. And that's the only reason he's not taking God's advice, which is it's the time when kings go out to war. And he's like, I'm king, I'm not going out to war. (laughs) And this is before he has that moment in battle where he's like getting tired and like, man, you're not coming out with this again. This wasn't a decision from the people. This is He was more than capable to go out. That's the other thing I want to point out. It's not like he was too old. He was more than capable and yet still chose to shirk his duties. I'm going to point us to Mark 15. We're going to spend a lot of time in Mark uh, 15. And so we're going to pick up here in verse 9, and here's what it says. 
Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to them. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. Okay, so here's, here's what I love about this. We're going we're gonna to highlight this for quite a bit here in a minute. But, but what I want to point out is when Jesus is on trial before Pilate, how often does he speak up for himself? Like, pretty much never. <laughs> he says that one thing the, the, the night before when they have literally stolen Jesus in the night. He's sitting before them, and they're just throwing accusation after accusation after accusation. How often does Jesus respond? Pretty much never. Okay, the reason Jesus is able to look at someone in the eye, and they can sit here and accuse him and accuse him and accuse him, and not say a word just because he understood who's in charge. He recognized, I don't actually have to justify myself to you. And in fact, I've already pleaded with the guy who's in charge. We're going to read about that here in just a second. I, I want to point out another part of this as well, though, is the problem when you don't know who's in charge is that you start to struggle with insecurity. Because you're not confident that the person who's in charge has your best interests in and so Jesus, up there before Pilate, you, you see this beautiful picture of not only Jesus knowing who's in charge, but the chief priests clearly not. Because the word literally says what? It was out of insecurity that they handed Jesus over. And so he goes, do you want me to release to you the, the king of the Jews? And all that insecurity starts coming up. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh-uh. You, you can't touch that button. So they start stirring up the crowd. They start going, hey, clearly we're right. He, he's a heretic. He, he's going around saying he's the son of God. How can he do that? He, all that insecurity starts coming up. Okay, what am I getting at? Okay, if you're dealing with insecurity, the solution is very simple. You don't understand who's in charge. Because if you understood who's in charge, you wouldn't be worried about losing something based off your good or bad behavior. And I mean that 100% because David, even in his affair, God says to him, you're still the king I want. It, it, I'm not happy about this thing you did. And, and there's going to be some consequences associated with that. But, but David, I want to communicate to you. If this was not enough, if being king over my people was not enough, I would give you as much and more. Because God's in charge. We're not in charge. If there is a more important lesson in this story, I don't know what it is, other than God is in charge and we are not. I heard it this way at work a couple months ago. Uh, the two most fundamental principles of life are this. It's God is God and I am not. If we can figure out that God is God and I am not, he's in charge, and, and my plans, hey, I can submit them before the throne. There is a righteous appeal system. It's called Go Talk to God About It. And you see uh, Paul doing it. You see Jesus doing it. We're going to read that here in just a minute. They go to God and they say, God, you got a plan? I got a plan too. Let's, let's talk through these plans. But the end of that conversation always needs to end with, but God is God and I am not. And even if he doesn't take my advice, am I still willing to worship him? And when you get to that place, you truly become an unstoppable Christian because you recognize he's God. And I don't, I don't have to give my way to be an effective servant of God Almighty. I want to read us another verse from John 10, 18. It says this. Jesus is talking about his life. He says, no one takes it away from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Okay, hold on. Just so we're all on the same page, he said, I have authority. He didn't say God the Father. He said God the Father gave me the authority. Okay, so what does it mean that Jesus still went to the cross? When we know from the garden he didn't want to. It means he recognized God is God, and I am not. I have a choice in the matter. <laughs> but I'm not going to choose wrong. Is this making sense? 
God is God, and I am not. Now, we're going to talk about Jesus laying down his life. I saw the coolest verse. I'm going to read to you here in just a minute, but we're, we're going to come back to that. Uh, I, I do want to point out something about insecure people, though. Because insecure people have this tendency to kiss the feet of those they think better than them and to spit on those they think of less. And how often have we been in the room, or even been the person, like I've been that person before, where you're in the room with someone you admire and someone you think is lower than you. And so you give this person half the attention they're due, and you give this person twice the attention they're due. Okay, there, there could not be a more important reason to recognize God is God. Because God does not care what their resume is, or their resume, or your resume. He's God. And the only thing that counts with him is when I tell you to do something, are you going to do it? Are you going to be obedient? Those are the people God gives big callings to. Here's the other thing I thought of the other day. I was, I was praying kind of through some stuff, and... I was like, God, aren't there certain people that are just irreplaceable? And as clear as I've ever heard it, he's like, no. I'm like, nope, I can replace them. How do we know that? Because he does. You have people say no to God, and so he raises up another. What does he say? What is literally, well, for one, Esther is the only book of the Bible which does not say God's name and does not have any quotes from God. So that's worth noting. But... Mordecai's talking to Esther. He says, if you do not stand up at this time, salvation will come from another. She's a hero because she said yes, not because she was God's only option. God is God. We are not. And if we'll say yes, we get to participate with God. We get to be tools of God. But God is God, and we are not. Now, I believe deep down in my heart, God wants all people to be saved. I think God is going to do everything he can to help people get saved. But if you don't participate with God, at a minimum, you don't get to see God save people in front of you. Now, I do think there are aspects to you that are necessary to helping further the gospel. Otherwise, God wouldn't use you. And at the same time, you're not the hot stuff that can't be replaced. Even think about Elijah. Elijah, probably the greatest prophet of all time. He's obviously, God says, the spirit of Elijah will prepare the way for my son, that being John the Baptist. I mean, big time prophet. And what is the promise to Elisha, his servant? That when Elijah dies, Elisha would have twice his anointing. Twice. Okay, he wasn't irreplaceable. Okay, now point number two. Uh, so you have to know who God is, and then number two, you need to know what he said. Okay, God is God. What is he saying? What is God saying to me? Luke 22, verses 31 through 32. Jesus is talking to Simon Peter, and he, he's essentially about to tell him, you're going to betray me. But before he does, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I pray for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Okay, this is probably the most encouraging verse I could read to you today. I'm going to explain to you kind of what I think this dialogue was uh, if you were in the room in that conversation. Kind of a way that we could understand it a little more clearly. He just turns to Peter and he says, uh, Peter, I know you're going to fail. Here's what you do afterwards. You see, I'm, I'm actually not that worried about your lack of perfection when your heart is formed. So you're going to fail. Here's what you do afterwards. Strengthen your brothers. That's what you do. You're going to fail, but afterwards, turn and strengthen your brothers. Okay, why is that a great promise? Because it means, even though I fail, God's not done with me. And I do not in any one way want to communicate to us today that failing to be obedient every time disqualifies us from participating with God. Look at David. He messed up. Slept with another man's wife. Killed that guy. And God still continued to use him. Okay? So, so messing up isn't actually the issue. It's where is your heart? Is your heart, God, 
I'm not perfect, but I want to serve you. I want to participate with you. Like, that's why he's a man after God's own heart. When Saul messed up, he ran from God. When David messed up, he ran to God. And so God said, you're going to be my king. Not because you're going to do everything right, but because you're always going to run back to me. And so Jesus, in this conversation with Peter, says, okay, actually, this is really amazing. Think about the fact in Romans that God says both Jesus and the Holy Spirit are before the throne praying for us. Okay, so when you look at the mistakes in your life, you need to understand Jesus has said this same prayer over you. That Satan came before my throne and he said, hey God, how about you let me sift them like wheat? And Jesus said, no God, let me tell you what my plans for them are. Even if they mess up, I still want to use them to encourage other believers. And you know what God said? Every single time he said, yes, Jesus, I'm doing what you said. I'm going to prove it to you here in just a minute, but this is so important that we understand. The only person who ever got a real no from God was Jesus. Okay, we get no's to things, but the only person who got a no, like, I won't show up for you, I won't save you, was Jesus. He's the only person who ever got that no. Luke 22, verses 50 through 2 through 53 says this. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come to him, and this is, this is in the garden, sorry. In the garden of Gethsemane, right when they show up to, to take him. He says, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Okay, I have always wondered why in the world did they not take Jesus sooner? Why did they even need Judas to betray Jesus? They knew where he was. Every day they knew where he was. They needed Judas because they had to do it in secret. So let me ask you this. Are there things that you need to do in secret? Because participating with Jesus doesn't have to be done in secret. Are there things that if people knew about, because you're doing them in secret, that you would be ashamed of? Because when we look at the life of Jesus, he goes, I was with you every day. We could have done this at any time. Am I leading a rebellion? Why do you got swords and clubs? Why is it 2 a.m. that you're showing up? I've been in the temple every single day. But listen, when we allow the enemy to speak to us in the dark, we will begin to act out of those lies. And I think this is so important. Here's the other thing about what I recognize in this passage. Is Jesus, after just complaining to God, has an almost instantaneous switch to go, God, when it's me and you, I'll be frank. I'll have an honest conversation. I'll say, I don't want to do this. But the moment I get my answer I'm going to settle in my heart. I will obey you. And so Jesus, he isn't complaining about being taken. He's complaining about the man. He already res was resigned to be taken. How do I know that? Because literally Peter grabs a sword, chops a dude's ears off, and Jesus goes, stop. <laughs> We're not doing that. Heals the guy and lets him take him. Jesus was resigned to obedience. And so when we let the enemy... Speak to us in the dark when we let the enemy fuel those insecurities I mentioned earlier of, oh man, he's going to take all your fame. He's going to take your position. You're going to be good for nothing. Then all of a sudden we're like, all right, what am I going to do? I have to, I have to do something right now. Is there someone near him? Is there someone near Jesus we can get to? Look, if, if it's done in the dark, are you really believing what God has said? Do you guys hear me right now? If it's done in the dark, do you really believe you're doing what God has said? If you have to get there in a sneaky way, if you have to get there outside of what God is clearly able to do, if you have to, if you have to do it out of your own power, is it really God? 
this is one of the best things that has encouraged me recently is if your dreams are so small that you can get there on your own, they're not from God. God doesn't get, give dreams if you can get there on your own. It's not how he works. I mentioned this earlier, but I want to be very clear. Uh, uh, Jesus holding his silence was recognizing I already talked to the man in charge. And that's why Pilate is so impressed. It literally says, and Pilate was amazed that Jesus made no reply. There's a verse I want to read to you. and It comes from Exodus 14, 14, and it says, the Lord will fight for you while you hold your peace. And I look at Jesus on that stage and I go, he's holding his peace. He's not fighting. He's not giving in to the chaos. See, he's not fighting. And what's so amazing to me is Jesus knew God's not fighting. God's actually orchestrating this. Okay, have you ever been in a situation where people are coming to you and they're saying untrue things about you to everyone around? They're building an army. And as they build an army, they're sitting there going, God, what do I do? And this is all you hear. The promise to us is God will fight for us while we hold our peace. The moment you start fighting, he's done. Okay, think about it this way. He gave me this picture, and it was so true. I'm not coming at you husbands and wives, but this is the best example I could see. We're the bride of Christ, so think of it this way. If a husband stands up for his wife, some dude's saying something to her, or you know, tries to reach out and grab her or something, husband stands up, the man's going down. The moment his wife goes, don't you stand up for me? I can do that myself. What have you just done to that man? You said you get in the back seat. You don't do what God created you to do, which is to provide a safe and protected place for me. You don't defend me. I don't need you. Go sit down. I'm going to deal with this myself. Okay. What do we do to God? When someone comes up and they say something about us, and we think it's our job to respond. We're saying, Jesus, you get in the back seat. I, I don't need you to stand up for me. You, you be quiet. I know what's best for me. I'm capable. Okay, here's the problem with the original sin, is Adam was passive and Eve was active. Okay, they should have been together. Okay, but now you have this constant struggle of men either being too much or too little, and women, when men are too little, try and fill in, and now they try and be the man. Women, not supposed to be the man. Men, not supposed to be passive and not supposed to be abusive. You're supposed to fill the role that God fills, which is I protect the things that I love. And so as the bride, I want to encourage us. God, Jesus, the one who got the no, who knows how it feels to sit on that stage while people mock him for the good that he has done, will never stand by while other people do that to you. I don't know how he's going to solve it. I don't know what it looks like in every situation. But I know that here's the promise, and he paid the price that you could always have that promise. He said, God, remain silent. I'll take this. But I'm going to strike a new covenant with you. And in this covenant, I get to speak up. <clears throat> and every day I'm going to be beside your throne. And every time that accuser comes up, and starts telling you about how he's going to sit for me like we. And starts telling you about all the lies he's been spreading about me. Jesus is going to stand up and he's going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. What are they doing down there? And God's going to be like, oh, they're, they're holding their peace. He's like, okay, good. They haven't put me on the sidelines. Now I can deal with this devil. 
Listen, Jesus is not an abusive husband. And if you tell him to shut up and sit down, he's going to shut up and he's going to sit down. But if you will submit to his position as your heavenly covering, not in a weird way, not in a... He wants to advocate you before the throne of God in heaven. And if we will hold our peace, he'll tell us what we need to do. I want to read something to you. It is, uh, it's my proof, if you will, uh, that God will never say no to defending us. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5. He was despised and rejected by a man. A man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. One from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our pains. Yet we esteem him stricken, struck by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our transgressions. Crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Okay, did you guys see that word peace? Did you see how in, in Exodus 14, 14 it said, while we hold our peace, and he already paid the price for our peace, and so if you'll hold on to your peace, he gets to fight for you. Okay, this is like having Mike Tyson in your corner, and saying, don't worry, Mike, I got this. Like, are you kidding me? He could knock anyone out with one punch. And we want to get in the ring. And so let, let's go a few rounds. Let's, let's test me against you. Let's put Mike Tyson in. Do you guys hear me? Okay. Here's the other thing that, uh, uh, or, or rather, here's the last thing I, I want to communicate. So the first one is we have to know that he's God. We've got to know what he said. And the last thing is we need to be who we are. Because when you know who God is, and you know what he said, and when I say you know what he said, what has he said about you? Not just what he's told you to do. What has he said about you? You don't even need a prophetic word for this one. It is so easy. You know what he calls you? He calls you a co-heir with Christ. He said, you betrayed me, but you know what I did? I sent my son to die for you, to marry you, and now you are on equal footing with the son of the living God. Let me tell you about my thoughts about you. I have more thoughts about you than the grains of sand on the seashore. Jeremiah 29, 11, what does that say? For I know the plans you have for me, plans for peace and not of evil, to give me a future and a hope. Okay, so, so I'm a son of God, I'm a co-heir with Christ who married Jesus. God has more thoughts about me than the grains of sand on the seashore. They're all good. Oh, and by the way, he's making plans for me. They're plans for peace and not of evil to give me a future and a hope. I can be that person. Can you be that person? Can you walk in confidence going, man... They're saying stuff, but you know what? I'm a child of God. God has good thoughts about me. He's making plans for me for a future and a hope. When you start thinking about that, it's pretty hard to worry about whoever saying whatever. Because God is making plans. Luke 22, verse 7, he says this. And they all asked, Are you then the Son of God? And he replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Okay, get this. Jesus died for refusing to be anyone else. <clears throat> do you know how easy it would have been for him to tell a little white lie and to justify it because, oh, well, well I, I'm still the son of God. He, he actually was still the son of God. He actually was that. But he did not cut a single corner even when it meant it's time to die. For being who you actually are. Sometimes we defend ourselves and we try and justify something that isn't even what we believe because we don't want to look a certain way. 
And Jesus goes, I don't care what you think of me. I'm going to be who I am. Even though I'm on trial. Even though I'm probably, not probably, even though I'm going to die from this. Even though you're going to torture me before I die. Are you the son of God? Yeah. Yep, that's me. Now I want to take us back to the upper room for just a moment. I, I, I want to point out something so awesome that I never paid attention to before. John 13, 1 verses, or John 13, verses 1 through 3. Now before the feast of, uh, feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from the world, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. While the Passover meal was happening, the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas that he should hand over Jesus. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. The very next verse is he starts washing the disciples' feet. Okay, this is why I stopped. Jesus did not have to wash the disciples' feet. God had already given everything into his hand. Do you guys hear me? He did not have to wash the disciples' feet. God had already given everything into his hand. He looks across the table at the man who's going to betray him. And he does not allow Judas' betrayal to determine how he would act. How often do we come before God's throne and say, God, yeah, I behaved poorly, but it's because of them. It's because of what they did. They're the ones who brought this on themselves. It's them, God. It's them. And literally, we're saying that to Jesus, who goes, oh, they said, they said you need. Did they betray you? To the men who you have constantly warned them about. He said, don't trust them. Don't trust them. And did they betray you with a kiss? Did they come up and kiss you on your face to betray you? I think so often that's why as Christians you hate the two-facedness of Christianity. It's because they did it to Jesus and there's something just inside of us that our spirit goes, get away from me with that. Don't come near me with that. Listen. What would it be like to be so confident in what God has said and who he is that you could sit across the table from the person who literally will betray you to your death. I'm going to wash your feet. I have the ability to call 12 legions of angels at any point. But I'm going to wash your feet. I have the ability to say stop at any point, And it will stop. But I'm not going to do that. I want to finish with this. It's Psalm 2, verses 1 through 9. And I encourage you just to let the Lord speak this over you as I read. It says this, Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords away from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath, and he will terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. There is nothing more the enemy wants to do than to discourage you. 
Because when he can discourage you, he can convince you that God is not God and that he does not do what he said. Because the only way as a Christian, you would live from, I'm not talking about our emotion. We all have emotions. We all have moments. The only way as a Christian, you would live from a place of I have lost is if you don't believe who God is, what he said, and what he's created you to do. Why did Jesus have no problem laying down his pride? He knew what was his. Listen, if there is an area of your life where you see someone else succeed and you feel insecure, you don't yet understand what God has said about you. Because when you understand what God has said said about you, you're not looking for anybody else's promise. You're not jealous of anybody else's success. Because you know what God has given you. And so you can love them to the end. And you can look at that person who's going to betray you. And listen, it said Jesus loved them to the end. All of them. Judas included. Have you ever thought about that? We think about the Jesus sent him and just was like, all right, fine, go do it. He loved him to the end. He served him to the end. Who do we serve to the end? Like, if I'm honest, I struggle sometimes on my bad days to serve my wife and my daughter. And you're asking me to serve Judas? Real. Okay. Well, we're going to pray. And here's all I want to leave you with. There's things that Jesus did on his approach that we absolutely need to mimic. And there's things that Jesus did on his approach that we will never have to suffer. And I think the most important one is God will never say nothing on your behalf Why you hold your peace. And if you are mad because you're like, well, God hasn't said anything. Are you holding your peace? Are you talking over the throne of God? Let's pray. Father God, we come free right now. And God, we realize that all things were given into your hand, and yet you still chose to love. And so, Father, as we come before you, God, I just pray that we would recognize who you are. You are God Almighty. God, you rose from that grave. And God, right now, we just thank you that you have said things about us. And God, I pray when the enemy comes around and starts accusing us to our face, to our friends, before your throne, that because of what your son did, God, you never have to stay silent. God, right now, we just let that stuff go. God, wherever we feel like we need to fight for ourselves, our reputation, God, we let that go. God, we believe that we're warriors. And God, that we do need to stand in the gap. But God, when it comes to our reputation, when it comes to what the enemy has to say about us, God, we just hold our peace. We do not have to justify ourselves to men or to the enemy when we are following the orders of God. I just kind of feel like right now God just wants us to let some of this stuff go. I just feel like we've all been holding stuff. And I just feel like we need to let that go. Like not even think about it anymore. When that person comes to mind, just... God's got that. God, 
God, I just pray that you would help us take a breath. No longer under this weight. God, we can just let it go. God, I pray for every person in this room right now, God, that they would be encouraged, that God, we would all know that you are before the throne, Jesus, you are our advocate to God Almighty. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, my encouragement to you is this. Uh, so often we come to church and it's an event and then it's over. Go back. Read through the different accounts of Jesus' way to the cross. See what God points out to you. Because there's some good stuff in there. And I just got this overwhelming sense while I studied that... I don't think we understand what it would have been like to be in the presence of Jesus. I mean, you think you think about when he's in the garden and he's going to war while everybody thinks he needed some alone time. Think about that. We all have this thing of like, oh, we just feel like they needed to be alone. That's what his disciples are like. He needs to be alone. He's going to war. What a guy to be around. That when we think he's not listening, when we think we're all alone, he's going to war. All right. Well, it is testimony time. So, if the Lord has been doing something in your life, which hopefully he has, uh, we definitely want to hear about it. So, what are those testimonies? What are those things that God's been doing uh, in your life that we need to hear about? Uh, one testimony... Uh, for me and Taylor, it doesn't feel like a testimony yet, but we're praying that it will be one. As we started building the shed uh, the other day, and I'll tell you what, this thing, it's falling apart two days in a row, and uh, but it's still here. It has not blown away. <laughs> and uh, I was looking out here on the patio this morning, actually, and our cushions to our chairs never blow away, because however the house is built, the wind doesn't get in, and the, cha- the cushions have blown away. It's like, must have been some ridiculous wind. Somehow, something I did to that shed has kept it together out there. So I'm taking that as a praise, because that would have been hundreds of dollars just gone if that thing flew away. So I'm taking that praise. God is with me in my shed. So, <laughs> Okay, who else? I'll share. Uh, well, I've been sharing with everybody about everything I've been going through and really been struggling with, like, where is God in all of this? And um, just, like, trying to do everything that he says in the word. And, you know, of course, it's the devil, and he's going to flee. And I'm like, but he's not. He keeps coming back. And then we were talking today. I just felt like the Lord came and sat next to me and was like, he's coming after you because I care about you. And he's trying to hurt you. And that was like a whole new perspective that it's not actually about me. And God cares about me that much, and I'm honored. And, um, but then just that you were sharing about how all we have to do is hold our peace. And I'm sitting here trying to like say every prayer the right way and use the right words, and then it'll work. And I just had this vision that like he is fighting for me, even though I can't, it doesn't feel like it. And then I wanted to share a vision he gave me after losing the baby because I felt very similar then, just that, like, while I'm going through this horrible thing, like, I just can't feel you near. And so he gave me this vision of when we were in the ER, and I was on the bed, and we had just found out what was going on. And I, it, Jesus came into the room, and, like, he put his hands through me, and, like, picked up the baby, and, like, took it up to heaven. And then he came back, and he picked me up, and he, like, looked at Satan right in the face, and, like, just gave me a look and like kind of like ripped me out of bed and was like she's coming with me and he walked me to the OR 
So I was just thinking of that. I'm like, well, I'm really doubting. Like, why aren't you being louder? Like, that's just not how it works. And Satan's loud. And God is quiet. So, you know, just during your prayer, I just felt like the Lord. I just felt a lot of peace. And I, he is fighting for me. And this is not last. So, anyway. That's awesome. Uh, just a cool testimony about the business this week. Uh, on Wednesday, me and Dad were just busy and working and doing stuff, and uh, got a random call from a dude who showed up. He was like, hey, I need some stair railings. And so he was like, can I stop by? We're like, absolutely, come on, stop by. And so he comes and checks stuff out and ends up buying some stair railings. And it was an upsell from what he was going to get, which was good for us, and it was totally out of the blue. And then... <laughs> Um, long story short, he came back that night to pick it up, but we weren't done yet. And so he was like, okay, why don't you just come meet me in the morning when you have it finished? And uh, so we went and met him, and turns out he owns an asphalt and concrete business all around the Bonham, Greenville, everywhere area, and is like a pretty major businessman, and freaking loved the railings that we made him, and was like totally blown away by it. And just was a real good connection to make. And he's like, oh, yeah, I told this guy about you already. I told that guy about you. Put your business cards up in this diner. Like, you guys are awesome. I had no idea you guys were even around here. And then as we were walking out to give him his, his stair railings, um, he pulled out some other dude. Said, hey, man, come check this stuff out. And so the guy goes and checks it out. That guy's building million-dollar storage units and all this other stuff. And he's like, oh, dude, that's crazy. I didn't even know you guys were around here. Like, I'm totally going to use you guys. Do you guys do signs? Like, I've got trees you can come get. And it was just just really cool that, you know, all we were doing was just what the Lord's told us to do. And this random dude shows up. We don't even know what he's about. And then all of a sudden, one thing leads to another. And we ended up doing a trade with him. And now we're able to fill in uh, basically the area in front of the mill with rock, which we've been trying to figure out how we're going to afford to do that. But we worked out a trade with him. And he already dropped off the rock at the house three hours after we made the trade. And so it's just it's just totally awesome. And just another confirmation that the Lord is working on our behalf and that we're in the right doing the right things and uh, yeah, so it's cool. Okay. But just something that was really sweet this week is a ton of random conversations were super encouraging to me. And a lot of people had, like, it kind of felt prophetic because they didn't know. But I had had different phone calls with people this week just talking and catching up with some friends about life and stuff. And they just had some super prophetic words from the Lord um, of things that are, like, pertaining to my life. And so that was just super encouraging because I didn't feel forgotten. And it's nice when people encourage you and then speak good things about you and good things about what you're doing and it just is really sweet to be encouraged and then it's also sweet for people to say things that are exactly what you're going through and then them speaking life into it so that made me not feel forgotten which was super awesome all right let's pray all right thank you for Thank you for the life that he lived. God, I pray that we would go out of this place and we would just be at a ridiculous peace. God, with this weather that's going to basically force us all to be inside for (laughs) quite a bit, God, we just ask that we would just be living from this unbelievable peace. And God, we believe that when we submit our prayers and requests to you, that peace is our promise. 
So God, whether we're in a garden begging you to change things, or God, whether we're on a mountaintop overwhelmed by your glory, God, I pray that every single one of us would leave just at peace. Leaving it all before your throne. And Jesus, we thank you that day and night you're reminding God the Father of what we need. Pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen.